Hi everyone, we are going to go into the 1950s today, a little bit of the cultural aspects of, uh, of just what it was sort of like to live there and all the new changes. Um, now, that might seem a little bit odd when you see this question in front of you and this, this kind of picture um, of the Great Gatsby, but thinking about the Roaring Twenties. Hopefully, we can remember a little bit about the 1920s in the United States, and usually when we, we think about that, we think about the Blitz. We think about the glamour, we think about the new tech, we think about kind of that Gatsby-esque lifestyle of that that kind of party and, and big city and, and all these brand new changes. The other thing to remember is kind of what we're coming off of um, from the 1920s is we're coming off of the First World War. So there's going to be a lot of similarities that, that we may be able to draw between the 1920s and 1950s, but there's going to be one huge, huge huge difference um, and that's going to be at the end of the 1920s we know that the great depression does come the economic collapse in 1929 and leads all the way to the 1930s hopefully we've set up all of these um fail safes and, and and nets to catch us if the event that some economic problem does come up that the new deal from the 1930s actually prevents something like that from happening again but We'll see how history goes. So today we're going to be talking about the lifestyle of the 1950s. Really, um, what we're going to be talking about, the extent of this week, is all about um, where American foreign policy and domestic policy went um, kind of in, in the 1950s. How is this different from times before? Today we're going to focus primarily on the domestic part um, we will get to the foreign affairs in a later video, but for now we're just going to talk about the domestic policy changes. To do that, first thing we can talk about is we can talk about our brand new president. So um, we will talk about President Eisenhower just very briefly before we start going into the culture. But the last time we talked about him was in the Korean War video where he um, helped end the Korean War um, and, and bring about that armistice, that peace. So we'll see what it looks like on the home front. So when Eisenhower comes to power, the big thing that he gets elected on um, is his ability to deal with conflict and war. Remember, he's a World War II like hero. He is the general that leads us through D-Day, um, the conquest over the Nazis and, and shutting down World War II in Europe. And so when he comes into power, a, a lot of people um, are really frustrated with two major things. Number one, Korea. Number two, something called the Red Scare, which we'll talk about a lot more in a future video, but really dealing with this paranoia that communism, number one, is, is taking over the world that we have to stop, but two, maybe there are communist spies in our country. So when Eisenhower comes to power, he tries to pro provide an antidote for what he sometimes calls K1C2. But if you look at that, it's kind of like a chemical compound, maybe you'd see in a chemistry class, but it stands for, for something different, the K for Korea. Right, the C is for communism and corruption. That's what Eisenhower is going to bring. He's going to bring transparency. He's going to bring order, and he's going to bring a swift end to a lot of these conflicts and these fears from around the world. He's going to bring in a vice president um, who was very, very big against communism and corruption. A man by the name of Richard Nixon. That is the same Richard Nixon from the Watergate scandal. So this is one of the first major times America gets really introduced to him. Um, but uh, we will see him more in the future. But the other thing that, that Eisenhower really vows that gets him kind of in office and that people really gravitate towards is he vows to go to Korea and personally end the war himself if he has to. Um, he doesn't care. He will end it um, and, and get America out of that violence um, to get us into a time of hopefully prosperity. And really when he does, he actually does go to Korea. He doesn't, this isn't just like a campaign speech of promise. He actually goes to Korea changes the entire United Nations battle plan, threatens China with nuclear war, and within less than a couple months of him actually taking office, the Korean War is over. So vastly effective, highly efficient, and boom, he keeps his campaign promises. So a lot of Americans are really happy with him for that. Um, and it, it makes them seem like their decision, which you see here, this election was obviously before that, but that he was very, very popular. If you look, that's a lot of red almost the entire country, even New England, which historically has, has mostly been blue states. Um, but 
all of the country except for really chunks of the southeast are uh, are heavily voting Republican. And so that's a huge, huge change. When we do talk about Eisenhower, um, he is a Republican. And so we see that red and we assume this is going to be a huge change. But Eisenhower is not... Um, like the Republicans of the 1920s, 1930s, or even before that, the Gilded Age. Um, he's, he's very different um, in that regard. And he kind of calls himself and his politics um, modern Republicanism. He doesn't say that I'm a true blood Republican and believe everything of those policies, but um, he is going to propose a different way of handling it. The other thing you may see, as you can see in that button down below or in the text, um, I'm going to refer to Eisenhower as Ike. Um, Ike was his nickname. Um, no, it is obviously not a shortened version of Eisenhower, so that doesn't really make sense. His first name is Dwight. Um, there's no K there either. Um, it was a nickname that he had when he grew up, but Ike was really big on um, conservative government spending right, and balancing the budget, so being fiscally conservative, but with money being very, very conservative, um, not like FDR or Truman, which were big on government spending, so very limited on that, but he didn't actively go out of his way to really end any of these New Deal programs, so he wasn't just Republican, um, like strong party politics where he's going to crush everything Democrat, but he did take um, a little bit of a step back. He wasn't as much in the government spending as Roosevelt would have been. Um, and really, all of this kind of comes down to a, this quote that, that he gives, um, I think, sums up his policies fully. Um, and I think it's really good and concise. I'm conservative when it comes to money, but I'm liberal when it comes to human beings. Right. So he's very concerned about the welfare of the United States, but he is also very concerned about overexpending. But he will get involved in issues um, in concerning civil rights that happened during his time period. Um, and an example of that could be the Little Rock Nine, which we'll talk about um, again in a later video on the on, on the civil rights movement. But really, all of this post-war, like really good lifestyle is going to be paired with a really strong Cold War foreign policy, meaning that we have a lot of strong stances around the world on some of these issues. But at the end of the day, that's going to give America this kind of buffer zone, at least for a short period of this appearance of, uh, of a lot of strength. And there's a couple other factors that lead into it. But because America is so staunch in their foreign policy around the world, America is also able to have a very prosperous decade in the 1950s and the standard of living is going to be far and beyond what anyone would ever have imagined would have been in that decade. Really, when we talk about the 1950s, although there are, there are seven years between the end of World War II and Eisenhower taking office, we really describe the 1950s as, as post-war life. This is what people think about when they think about the immediate post-World War II life in the 1950s. Under Eisenhower, life is good. So there's a variety of different reasons why America is so affluent in the 1950s and why their standard of living is so high. One of them being that there's a huge demand and desire for different consumer goods, what we typically call luxury goods. We didn't have it in the 1930s. And think about why, what was going on in the 1930s, the Great Depression. And we didn't really see it in the 1940s either. Why is that? World War II was raging on until 1945, and then we kind of had to pick up those pieces. So America had never really um, had this since the 1920s. So there's a little comparison there. We have record players, cars with automatic transition, something we really took for granted. So no stick shift. These things could automatically shift. It made, it made driving so much easier, and the learning curve – um, was much easier to accomplish. Televisions in homes all across the country. That's new forms of entertainment, yes, but new forms of information. We have um, different forms of filtered cigarettes um, and even refrigerators. So all these kind of things that we assume are, are just normal for today's standards, um, these things were very, very revolutionary for their time period. And a lot of people had these luxury goods. We had a lot of spending during the Cold War, and so because of that, the government was filling a lot of orders for businesses. Businesses were expanding. They were able to provide other goods, 
for a lot of their workers. Their workers could then go and they could spend it on other um, products and other businesses like these consumer goods, which helps boom those businesses. There's a huge baby boom, which a lot of the soldiers come back from World War II, and, and we're not going to get into the birds and the bees, but um, when a mommy and a daddy love each other very, very much, sometimes the stork comes and drops a baby at the doorstep, and that's how babies are born, and there's a lot of babies around the country. Um, there is a huge movement to the suburbs as well, because people have this money, they can buy their own property, it becomes cheap, it becomes mass produced, Americans become extremely efficient in everything that they're doing and what's crazy about this this kind of whole story is you think about how quickly this changes um from the 1930s to 1950s so if you were born in say around 1930 right around the beginning of the great depression you grew up you were a child in the great depression by the time you're in the 1950s you're ready to have children you're married you have a job settled down that next generation you went from the worst depression economically our country and arguably the entire world has ever seen to the highest standard of living in all of world history. That's not just saying U.S. history, but all of world history in just one generation. Right? That is extraordinary. And so with all of this kind of going around, there is going to be a huge push to keep it that way. And because of that, there's going to be a shift from this kind of individualistic art style and lifestyle, and everything is going to be big on conformity. Everything is going to look the same. Everything is going to feel the same. Everybody's going to have the same products. Mass production society. There are really good parts of that, really bad parts of that, but we'll unpack that as we go. One of the most iconic pieces of the 1950s is the creation of the Highway Act. Now, what seems crazy is before the 1950s, highways didn't exist. Um, there were little small roads. Obviously, you go through the country from town to town, and you could go through your cities, but there weren't these huge open highways where you could travel for miles and miles at high speeds, open areas, clean roads. And so it was something completely brand new. Um, it, it didn't happen in the United States until the mid-end of the 1950s. Um, the reason why is because automobiles became mass produced after um, World War II. Um, they were, the mechanized system was highly efficient as they learned in World War II. People had a lot of extra money and they could start buying cars, sometimes multiple cars for their family. Um, and America's society, you were required really to be able to have a car to function. Um, everything about it began to change towards the car. The car was like an extension of your home, and you could take that, and you could go anywhere you wanted in this country. Now, the important thing to understand is why was this created? It wasn't created so that people could drive really fast and get place efficiently. The purpose of it is, remember, we're still in the middle of the Cold War. Now, we haven't really talked about it. Um, we talked about Korea, but we haven't really talked about anything in the 1950s yet, but really taken into account that we are in the middle of the Cold War still. Atomic weapons are really, really um, a, a reality for so many people um, that this could possibly happen and wipe out the face of the earth. Um, and so there had to be a preparation in case of nuclear bombs came that there has to be an evacuation route, right? It also became a reality that if we were going to be invaded, that we need to move troops wherever we wanted to. A lot of these original highways that are created are like giant open runways so that if we need to fly planes over, drop tanks, drop jeeps, drop soldier supplies, we can literally drop them anywhere because all of these highways are really just like a giant open runway. That's all it is. And so for all of these creation of the highway system, um, there's so many different effects. There's the reason why it was created. Do we ever use it for that? No. But you also talk about what are the actual practical effects of it. Um, the whole purpose, like I said, was national defense. But because of that, civilians could use it. Interstate trade, you could trade between cities, between states with ease, and you could create the whole trucking industry, even vacation travel. Right? You may not be able to fly everywhere right, as a civilian, but you can drive everywhere because you have a car, and it opens up the entirety of the country. Brand new pieces of Americana are created that we never had before. 
And the craziest part about this is it wasn't through any um, massive, massive um, upfront increase of government spending. All of this was raised solely through taxes of things related to cars. There were taxes for gas, right? There's a tax built to gasoline. There's a tax built in the cost of tires, right? And what they do on the road and the individual has to pay that. And then for the cars themselves, and all of these things help pay for the entire highway system in the United States of America. And it completely revolutionizes the way we live and work with each other. This is a map of all of these major highway systems. So you can go literally from Boston to LA, you can drive from coast to coast. There's so many different little pieces across this country that are now accessible because of this major highway system. Because of that, people start advertising cars like crazy because cars are extremely accessible. There are all of these bright, shiny colors, right? You're gonna see a lot of blues, a lot of yellows, a lot of greens, right? Ford becomes this household name. They have different styles of cars, but really long, big bodies, a lot of storage. Right. So you can see like the guy in the yellow car, the station wagon, the, the, the ranch wagon, as it's called down there in the bottom left. Put all those groceries in store things. You can use it for leisure and it becomes a status symbol, the type of cars you can have. But it becomes extremely normal for Americans all across the country to have automobiles. It's extremely normal. Because of that, all new forms of businesses come up. Right? You have drive-in everythings, including drive-in restaurants. So if any of you have ever been to a Sonic, a Sonic is, is one of the last um, major chains that still use that system. But that used to be the common place for all types of restaurants. Fast food restaurants like McDonald's and Burger King weren't really that big. McDonald's starts out in California, but it originally was a, a, a drive-in like barbecue place that was failing. And they realized they made a whole bunch of money off of just selling hamburgers really really quick and then they shifted all of their stuff into it they changed their kitchen to be like an assembly line like the production of these cars it made everything massively massively efficient the car culture is everything everywhere you're driving everything you can do so now you can live in one city and work in another and it's extremely easy and normal or this without this form of transportation that's not viable, that's that's ridiculous, it's not accessible. But the car industry also builds up so many other industries. There's the mechanical engineering industry, there's actual car production industry, <clears throat> there is the tire industry, there's the gasoline industry, and then all the individual parts and materials that make up the cars as well. Um, and Americans are able to use these cars for everything. You can take long distance vacations, you can live in other places, so it gives people choices. They can live outside the city and they can work in it. Or one of the most iconic parts of American culture, Disney. Um, that concept is really created and, and sort of built in the 50s. Um, and, and people can travel all across the country to flood to these Disney resorts, these Disney theme parks. Now in Florida and California, now all around the world. It's part of this Americana being spread. People can access it similar to the way the radio in the 1920s, 1930s brought people together through communication. The car in the 1950s does that in a brand new way. You have restaurants that you can drive up into. They're basically like an extension of your home and people spent so much time and so much money on these cars that people didn't really wanna leave it. So you'd have people that would be car hops where you could, they would uh, deliver your food all the way out um, to your car and you could eat in your car. Um, in this case, McDonald's was revolutionized the fast food industry, whereas a self-service window where you would still drive up to it. But these pieces become kind of like quintessential of what Americana is all about. You have drive-in movie theaters, right? You turn your radio station to a, to a specific channel so you could watch and stay in your car and watch these movies. Everything was built around the car. Now, when I think about the 1950s and the changes and a lot of these big names that have come up, um, I always think about fast food. And I spend so much money on fast food. Um, food is love, food is life. But ultimately, when we're talking about fast food, you may have your go-to, right? And you know how much it costs, right? Me, oh, I'm a sucker for that Wendy's four for four. Oof, every time, right? I know what I'm gonna get. 
right? Maybe you're, you're the double stack type of person. Maybe you're the chicken sandwich type of person, whatever your choice is, right? You know how much it costs. It's still going to cost you about four bucks, right? Um, and change after tax. So that's still a, considered a really, really good price today. Now think about, right, how much most meals cost a fast food restaurant, right? It's going to cost you, if you get the drink and the fry and the sandwich, somewhere around like six, seven bucks, depending on what size you get. It could be eight, nine, ten. Depends where you're at, what you're spending. When we talk about McDonald's, McDonald's um, is this brand new drive-in concept where you walk up under these golden arches, which is why it gets its nickname from. Um, and it's this brand new kind of advertising style, the way that they pitch to people and the cost that they're able to get because they mass produce things, right? They're very efficient. They can sell a whole bunch and they can turn a huge profit margin, right? So this is one of McDonald's menus back in the end of the 1950s. Number one, those prices, right? And number two, look at those names and how they're describing everything. The tempting cheeseburger, golden french fries, the delightful root beer, you can even buy a refreshing cold milk. All of these things, you're selling them for so, so cheap that you can mass produce them at an extremely high rate. They're efficient, they're quick, you can take it on the go, and every time you go there, you can replicate the same product. It's kind of like that scientific method of the Gilded Age of mass production or the assembly line that's really taken and revolutionized the fast food industry. When we talk about what families are, are doing at this time, the amount of income um, that families have drastically increases over the whole decade from the 1950s to the 1960s right it almost completely doubles the amount of money that the family has on average um, in this country what they're bringing in and it's completely revolutionary for americans the amount of excess funds that they have and are able to spend you're going to see them spend it on so many different forms of new luxury um, items like a refrigerator with a freezer um, but also the other thing you can take note in these advertisements is notice kind of how they're being advertised, right? So notice how women are being depicted in this um, advertisement, right? Why be a kitchen juggler? Why juggle many foods to get at a few, right? And they make it everything easy to grab and easy to get to and everything's nice, dandy, wonderful. But also that, that women are just housewives in, in a lot of these advertisements that you're going to see. Right, walking around the house in dress, hair done up, makeup, uh, high heels and an apron, um, jewelry, everything that doesn't, mm, that's not really realistic is what we would imagine of what it's like today if we see people in housework. But this is how it's depicted in the 1950s and the social standards of the way you dress and behave are going to be very different. You have things like the waffle iron that's created. Love waffles, right? All these great luxury items. Do you need it? Absolutely not. But are waffles amazing? Hell yes. We have things like the television, the Motorola, like those, the company that now makes like phones still, um, they used to make televisions. Now notice that you don't just get the box, you get the whole set. It's a whole setup. You also have all of these different sizes of TVs here that you can really um, kind of take in about what's considered huge and what's considered not. So if you zoom in on some of these images, as you see here, like the 16 inch TV there on the bottom, right? It says you'll marvel at the brilliant marvel of this life size 16 inch rectangular screen. And the one up above was the, the big box, the big family unit. 20 inch TV and okay that some people may have that in their bathroom or their kitchen or, or any little corner of the house and that's nothing but at this time this was huge people have video in their homes you no longer have to go to the movie theaters to get that it changes everything and Tupperware we're able to conserve food we're able to make it last longer there's so many other things that we have access to now that we can store and preserve food it's going to change so many things for so many people at this time, are there strict gender roles? Absolutely, and women are gonna be doing a bulk of really all of the housework, and it's gonna be expected for them to do that. But if they can prepare food ahead of time, 
if they can cut down on the amount of time it takes to cook, they can then spend their time going getting another job or taking um, part in other luxury activities. Because before this time period, a lot of these preservatives and, fro and actual good frozen food and the ability to preserve and store these foods ahead of time, well, uh, women had to make three meals from scratch every single day. You couldn't preserve things for the long amount of time that we do today changes so many lives with these consumer goods. You also see some big parts of American culture like the Coca-Cola bottles, right? Those big glass bottles, right? The pause that refreshes at home. Now that's all great, dandy and well, but think about how women are portrayed. Look at the text down below. Home, housework brings that urge to pause and relax in an easy chair. Do it with ice cold Coca-Cola. It adds to relaxation. What relaxation always needs? Pure, wholesome refreshment. Now, this is what women are doing all day. Posing, as you can see in that little um, kind of cartoon, with a vacuum, right? All of these things about how women are depicted in all of these advertisements are going to tell us about a lot of norms that we're going to do in another video. You also, again, see car advertisements, you see different types, different ways, families interacting, it's a full family activity. Going in these car rides, going in these um, long trips in these cars. You can even see the amount that people are buying on credit as well. So how that, that again, that consumer culture that we saw in the 1920s, is this gonna rear its ugly head again? Are we gonna have the same economic crash? We don't know yet, but we know that there's a lot of income. It's much more widespread than the 1920s. And hopefully there is a lot of safety nets to catch us in the event that something happens to continue this growth and this investment in our economy. Now, we also talked about how change occur, occurs in this country, the amount of people being born. Um, between the late 1940s and, and, and throughout the 1950s, America has experienced what they call a baby boom. Um, it gets so high that in 1957, a baby was born every seven seconds on average. Um, the amount of people having children, because they can, they have all of this extra money to spend on it. People from this generation are called baby boomers. By the time they grow up, and they're actually in their teens and college years, they're in the 60s and the 70s. So this generation is gonna be the hippies and the, and the counterculture revolutionaries in the 60s and the 70s. And when we get around to age around today, these are the people that are now starting to take a part in uh, social security soon or already have. And as a result, that's gonna put a lot of strain on the economy because we weren't expecting to really fund that many people when we created the security in the 1930s. All new industries boom because of this baby industry, whether you have the iconic Gerbers and baby food industry, but um, whether it be the healthcare industry, whether it be the daycare industry, child toys, so many different things that are introduced because of the amount of children. It's a whole new market for business. We see books, um, we see lifestyle coaches, all of these things that are really part of this culture because people have the money to do it. You see these iconic Fisher Price toys. I grew up, my grandma used to have a giant, you could like sit in and like pedal with your feet, like the Flintstones, if any of you get that reference or know what that cartoon is. But um, it was this cool, cool thing that a lot of kids had um, all throughout the 50s, became a staple in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and they're still around today. You can also see the other effect is obviously they're gonna grow up. So if you notice in the 1940s and 1950s, the amount of school enrollment, and you can see this because between 1930 and 1940, right here, right, we have the Great Depression and between 1940 and 1950, we're here, we're gonna have World War II. There's this huge spike when people start having kids, and a huge spike again. So note that trend, when these kids start growing up, it's not even so much when they're born, but how um, culture changes once they become of age is really gonna impact American culture. All of these pieces, right, whether we're talking about the introduction of cars and luxury goods, or we're talking about the increase of the number of people in this country, right, the baby boom, um, there are so many different types of workers um, in this country now because so many different markets open up and people have new access to money. People that used to live in separate types of housing um, neighborhoods are all living in the same general place. 
we're going to have blue collar, which are manual labor workers, and white collar, which we typically see in the business field. Think about the type of clothes that they wear, blue collar, like denim, right? Think like a mechanic or manual labor or white collar, like a businessman, like a salesman, right? They're going to live in the same neighborhoods um, because they're going to create all these brand new neighborhoods because people can buy houses. They're needing different cars. Um, to actually transport from point A to point B. They're going to need new grocery stores. They're going to need sh new shopping centers. Um, all of the family life is going to be different. Um, it's it's not no, so much the extended family like you see in the urban center where it's multi-generational, but the nuclear family, that cliche perhaps, but that stereotypical mom, dad, and two kids living in the little house with the dog, um, that becomes much more of the norm. For a lot of people, it's not these huge um, kind of tenant apartments like we saw in the Gilded Age or the crowded areas in the 1920s. But also with that, there is a little bit of a racial component. The people that are getting the most, like the people that are having um, these individual neighborhoods that are living more so in the suburbs, are not necessarily going to be people of color. And this phenomenon called white flight occurs, where um, a, a lot of white, blue collar, and white collar workers are going to leave and live in the suburbs. Um, and a lot of these urban centers are going to be predominantly people of color because they're going to have less access to these means to move out. And not all opportunities are going to be equal. Yes, there will be a large overall increase in the standard of living for all types of people, but the amount or that glass ceiling, if you will, is going to be different um, for sure racially and ethnically. A great example of this um, is, is a place in New York called Levittown. Levittown, New York, um, began after World War II when it was originally going to be renting homes to veterans to get them back on their feet, get them supported. But as people filled these up so quickly, these individuals realized that they could make a whole lot of money off of this and became mass production of houses. If they do the same thing very quickly, very simply, they could throw up houses left and right and have a lot of different people move in. They could sell so many because of their uh, increased production levels. By 1951, so four years later, there were 17,000 homes that were sold, not just rented, bought and sold in this area. And so they're going to continue to build these giant suburban lifestyles. They look very grid-like, right? Um, and, and some of you may live in a situation like this, or you've been people's houses or you've seen situations that are like this, like these giant, giant neighborhoods almost, or these interconnected little streets and, and everything. But these are all created. And a lot of the houses in these neighborhoods all look the same. They were mass produced. It was the mom, dad, and a couple kids living in this little house. It could have one of two styles. There was either the Cape Cod house you see over on the left or the ranch style house you see over on the right. But they could mass produce these models at a very, very quick rate. They bought a lot of their product in bulk. They had people that did the same task over and over again and were able to build these houses very, very quickly, which allowed them to sell them very, very quickly. And in these areas, um, we are going to see a lot of different lifestyle changes. Church membership skyrockets. Um, the number one kind of discernible feature amongst some of these suburbs was their religion and they built churches for their communities in these areas. Um, the phrase under God is inserted into the Pledge of Allegiance that now students say every single day across the United States of America and that comes from the 1950s. Separate ourselves from the communists in the Soviet Union and, and in communism there is no religion because religion to them denotes inequality because there are different levels inside of organized religions. Public schools are going to grow. College education becomes a normal goal. It's an accessible goal. Before, in, in decades and centuries past, this was only, this university was only for the top, 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 top tier of society. This becomes an extremely normal, tangible goal for so many middle-class Americans middle-class children, it becomes a normal discussion, where today it's almost considered right odd if you don't. And now the question is, the goal is, do I want to go on and get my master's after high school for a lot of people or after my um, bachelor's degree? Um, and so all of these little decisions, these changes become um, part of the norms about what's expected of you and where is this emphasis going to lie in my life?
So many people in the 1950s really take advantage of something called the GI Bill. The GI Bill um, is for GIs who are soldiers in World War II that um, get their education paid for by the federal government. So people are able to access this higher level of education. And because they're able to access that, they can have that dream for their children. Um, speaking of children, as well as all of this big push for conformity and increased lifestyle, a big piece of uh, American culture at this time in the 1950s is most definitely the film industry. And in the film, there, the film industry, there are a lot of pushes um, or, or topically you'll see a lot of pushes at uh, teenage, uh, what we call delinquency um, or not following the rules. It could be promiscuity, it could be danger, it could be whatever, but you have things like teenage crime wave or the cool and the crazy um, and the date bait. And so this young, um, culture that's really emerging of these baby boomers may be a little bit contrary and come into conflict in the next decade with um, their parents. But in the 1950s, conformity is heavily, heavily praised. An example of this could be music of the 1950s. Um, in the 1950s, um, there was a style of music called doo-wop, but more famously, the uh, music of the kids was rock and roll. Um, it was a variety of different artists, kind of stems from the soul and the jazz movement. Um, but there are both black and white artists that are in homes and in the ears of children all along the country. And so even if you are, say, um, living in an all-white neighborhood in the suburbs, you can still experience and access music by black artists. Um, there's so many different famous ones, um, African-American artists like Ray Charles, Chuck Berry, Fats Domino, Lil Richard. My favorite is Ray Charles, which got a picture of him. Uh, and there were also some really, really iconic white artists in this genre as well. Probably um, the most famous one is definitely being Elvis Presley, um, who was like the bad boy of music. And um, whether it was the, the subjects that they were talking about, just like the subjects perhaps in movies that parents didn't want them to see, or it was their dance moves, a lot of hip thrusting um, that was deemed inappropriate for young listeners and young viewers. Elvis Presley was this phenomenon, whether it was um, his sultry voice or the, the, the songs he was singing or musical ability or um, his dance moves, he, he made a lot of girls swoon, as they would say, in the 1950s. He was the um, you have people freaking out over Elvis, um, just like they will in the next decade over groups like the Beatles. All of this um, musical fame amongst the young audience, he also faced a lot of backlash from older audiences. This is a, um, a preacher who's holding up a giant poster for the Elvis Presley show that's coming into town. Um, and, and preaching about how awful this music is and how it's the devil's music and rock and roll music is a sin. So there's a little bit of cultural clash brewing between um, the, the younger um, people in the society and some of the older. There's a little bit of clash in culture, not so much as we saw in the 1920s, but it's going to be brewing in the 60s and 70s when the hippie movement the counterculture was really pop up. But Teenagers' lifestyles were super important to understand in the 1950s. These suburban teens especially had so much leisure time. They had extra money to spend, whether it was their families or they were able to pick up jobs. This was one of the first generations that didn't have to worry about kind of war or that instability. They could actually focus on going to school and actually having teenage years, which isn't normal. Um, up until this point, this becomes the brand new norm, including right um, a lot of different relationships and dances, and as I said, everything is happening in the cars, whether it's driving, whether it's going to see a movie, or in this case, making out. Um, we also see kind of like dance styles are are really popular in the 1950s, and dances in general. It was like the weekend thing to do. Um, where everybody would go out and they would just go dancing. Um, you could sell things based on kind of youth and being cool and all these different consumer goods really buying into it in different forms of advertising. What's also important to understand, though, is not everybody was in this cookie-cutter culture and, 
and um, everybody dressing the exact same. Um, in the 1950s, there were groups of people that were against this suburban culture. Um, different writers and artists of different types of genres or, or styles. Um, the most famous one um, or leader of this kind of anti-consumer culture, anti-conformity movement that really wraps up the 1950s is a man called Jack Kerouac. Um, he's a member of something called the Beats Movement or the Beatniks. Um, it's a counterculture group to the 1950s, really refusing to conform. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Grease, right, um, you're going to have John Travolta's character, which is um, more along this line, kind of that bad boy line, pushing against, not following the rules. But they use, the beatniks actually take it a little bit further. Um, really criticizing kind of American social values and where the country is heading. And this is the beginning of the hippie movement that comes to the 19th. Um, they're really um, kind of find their roots in kind of Buddhism and this idea of um, beatitudes, which are kind of this inner grace that you can find of this, this purity, stability, right? We can find essence of this attempt to you know, fix societal problems in different decades. In the 1950s, there is a huge movement and wave. You see this all through media. You see it through music. You see it through movies. You see it through advertisements, but all of it is going to have its negative effects. There is going to be a huge movement of the baby boomer generation growing up in the 50s that's going to start to rebel against it, reject it, and there's going to be an extreme counterculture movement. The Beatniks were more popular on the West Coast um, is really where they, they kind of start to bloom and it's going to be also the hotbed for um, the hippie movement that really pops up but we can see it through um, books we can see it through different forms of art right now art at this time that was more popular um, is not going to look like this but this is going to be some of the most famous american artists um, really are going to take hold in the 50s and the 60s and they're going to be critiques questioning what's going on in American society. Um, you're going to see famous names like Jackson Pollock. Now, if you look at this painting, it's not really going to look like much. And for you, you may look at that. Nothing's uniform. It looks like random throws of paint on a page, and that's it. And part of it, that is the point. It's, it's questioning why are we all doing the exact same thing? Why can't we branch out? called abstract art. It's not supposed to necessarily look like anything, but this is just one of the many examples. Um, Jackson Pollock is one of the most famous American artists of this time period, and, and this art style um, of, the, of that period that really comes back to life um, and, and really questioning why is America so conformist and questioning people's um, values and, and encouraging to, to kind of think outside that box. We're also going to see other um, types of art, um, one from Mark Rothko. Um, again, also, it's not, it's very minimalist and, and breaking kind of, as it says there, breaking the constraints of realism. What everything is told, it has to be purposely doing things that aren't. Or people directly sort of calling out um, what is happening in their world and how they see the world. Um, this is a picture that's uh, reproduced in, in sort of different colors of a very, very famous, famous actress at the time, Marilyn Monroe. And Andy Warhol, the artist, um, is really making a lot of critiques on American society through this piece, which you may have seen, maybe you've seen with Albert Einstein, maybe you've seen this art style before, but everything is really the same that's being carbon copied. You may throw a new slap of paint on it, but um, everybody is, is looking the same and we need more individuality. So everything is mass produced and everyone is mass produced or even one of his most famous art pieces of all time, some of the most expensive American art pieces if you ever have seen an original or could get your hands on original are paintings of Campbell's soup cans. Um, but again, it's staying that message that everything is really coming down to being forced to be the same thing and questioning all of this conformity in American society. 
Now that we've taken a look at a couple different aspects of American society um, in, in good depth about the affluence and, and really all the things that um, the 1950s American lifestyle really has going for it, you're going to take a peek at the um, awesome, awesomely painful to watch at times, so cringeworthy is the best word, a date with your family. Just kind of like if you've seen or if you remember Duck and Cover, um, this is also supposed to be serious. So you're going to be thinking about not so much just the norms of society and the affluence, but what are the norms inside a family? What are the roles of children? What are the gender roles? And take note of that. In our next video, we'll take a deeper look into the discussion on gender roles, but this will be good for now. Again, as always, if you have questions, drop some comments down in the section below.